Call all hands. Speak to quarters. Run out the guns. Stand by the starboard battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Presenting Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. discursive. Perhaps it's an old man's impatience and eagerness that has made me hurry on with these memoirs without regard to their order or date, but as I near the end of my chronicle, I remember much that was vital in my career that I permitted. Surely the year 1811 was one of the most fateful of those years. I was a prisoner in the hands of the French. It seemed nothing would break the monotony until... One evening. What is it that Monsieur desires? I want to see. There, there's a battle out there. I must see it. Let me go onto the walls. I'm sorry, it is forbidden. I will not escape. I swear it. Let, let my servant and myself go onto the walls. I give you my word of honor. We'll make no attempt to escape. You come with us, if you will. But I cannot leave my post. You, you give your word of honor. Yes, yes, yes. You may rely on it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Come on, Brown. This way, Brown. Hi, sir. Uh, now, don't get in the way of the gunners, or they'll send us down again. Hi, sir. Hi. It's over here to the curtain wall. We shan't be blinded by the gun flashes here. It is the fleet, sir. Yeah, you can see them lit up by their own broadsides. They're, they're, they're sailing down in, in line ahead, past the Frenchies. Oh, there's the Pluto, sir. Yes. You, you can see the Admiral's flag at her mizzen. That's the Caligula astern of her. Excuse me, sir. Uh, what's that, uh, that little red glow out there? Where? Oh, uh, over there. Uh, right out at the entrance of the bay. Uh, seems to be getting brighter, sir. Yes, it's a fire ship. Oh, I see. oh, good work. Our men are bringing in a fire ship. Just the thing for a squadron at anchor. <laughs> yes, you can see it now. It's a small brig. And it's alongside the Turin, sir. Yeah. Uh, the Turin was that ship that got away from us. She's not getting away from this, by heaven. Let's look at her masts. The fire's running up them already. <laughs> there goes our magazine. Oh, she'll drift down onto the French squadron. Oh, we ain't fair, sir. Us stuck up on here with all that going on. Yeah, look at our ship. Look, the Sutherland on the beach. Ah, she's a fire, sir. Oh, they must have sent a boarding party and fired her. <laughs> oh, well done. They, they won't have the privilege of keeping even the wreck of a British ship. That's a wonderful night's work, Brown. It was indeed a wonderful night's work. From our battlement grandstand, we watched the one-sided battle rage and saw our defeat thoroughly avenged. The Turin had completely vanished. Of the Sutherland, there were only remaining a few blackened timbers. Two French ships of the line were on the rocks to westward, and they would never sail again. Only the French three-decker was left, battered and mastless, and the next easterly gale would fling her ashore and wreck her completely. As dawn crept over the horizon... We watched the five British ships stand out of the bay in line ahead. Only the Pluto appeared to be damaged. She'd lost her main topmast. It was a bitter sight to see them go and realize that I could not go with them. But my despair was cut short by the sudden appearance of General Vidal, the governor of the fortress. 
fine piece of work your companions have done. Uh. But it will not make the government in Paris any more kindly disposed towards you, I fear. Listen, what is that? Ah, that must be your man. The new prisoner uh, must have brought them news of the battle. The new prisoner, sir? Yes, I thought you would be interested. He's a man who fell overboard from your admiral's ship. Uh, here, Dupont, take charge of Hornblower and escort him to the prison. Back in my room, I paced to and fro, my mind seething. My gloomy thoughts were broken into by the opening of my door, and the young officer saluted. His Excellency sends you his compliments, sir, and he would be glad if you could spare him a few minutes of your time as soon as convenient. Ah, ah. Or in other words, come at once. Oh, very well, I'm ready. In the governor's office stood a colonel of gendarmerie. A youngish man with a bullet head and carrying a cocked hat in his hand. The star of the Legion of Honor was on his breast. The high black boots and spurs gleamed in the morning sunlight. The governor's expression was sad as he addressed me. I have the honor of presenting to you Colonel Jean-Baptiste Caillard, Grand Eagle of the Légion d'Honneur, and one of His Imperial Majesty's personal aide de camp uh, Colonel, this is Horatio Amblaire. What is Onblower doing with that sword at his side? Uh, the Admiral returned it to him on the day of the battle, Mon Colonel. He said... I am not interested in what the Admiral said. No criminal as guilty as this man can be allowed a weapon. Further, a sword is the emblem of a gentleman of honor, which he certainly is not. Take off that sword, sir. I can hardly believe that you're addressing me, sir. May I remind you that I have yet to be tried? Take off that sword. Or shall I call in one of my gendarmes to remove it? You leave me no alternative. But you shall hear more of this insult. Good. And now, will your excellency have the goodness to warn this man of his impending departure? Oh, yes. Uh, monsieur, Colonel Caillard has come to take you and your first lieutenant, Mr. Uh, oh, Bush, to Paris. Bush? But you know what you're saying? Bush is seriously wounded. It... It might easily be fatal to take him on a long journey at present. <laughs> the journey will be fatal to him in any case. General Vidal was a gentleman to the last. He gave me every assistance, allowed me to take my coxswain, Brown, with me. He even pressed upon me his purse to help me when I should reach Paris. He accompanied us to the courtyard where Bush was lying on a stretcher. Bush? Ah, they're going to take us to Paris, Bush. But, uh, you, me, sir? Yes. Well, uh, it's a place I've always wanted to see. Please, you are in charge of this man, yes? Yes, yes, what is it? I am the, uh, the, the surgeon who, uh, who uh, how do you say? Uh, uh, the foot. You amputated Lieutenant Bush's foot. Uh, oui, yeah. it was to save his life. Please to take these papers. There are instructions for treatment. Any surgeon in France will understand them. Yes, thank you. Here is a parcel of uh, dr dressings. Thank you. Uh, the leg will not heal until the uh, ligatures come away. Yes. Uh, I see. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, I understand. How are you feeling, Bush? Better? I do feel a bit better today, sir. Since you got that last ligature out, I think it's healing. Good. I don't mind telling you, I thought we'd lost you a few nights ago. Didn't you, Brown? Yes, you looked pretty ticklish, sir. <laughs> Rare good job you've done, sir. Me? I don't know what I'd have done without you. I never knew you could turn your hand to so many things. I wish to heaven I wasn't such a burden to you, sir. Oh, if only I could help myself. Hello? What's going on? As far as I can make out, sir, one of the horses has gone lame. Oh. Uh, They've unharnessed it. Um, oh, yeah, two of them are just taking it off to find a smith. Oh, as though this confounded journey wasn't long enough. Ugh, seems as though all our lives have been spent in this leathery old coffin. 
Oh, we're off again with only three horses, sir. Uh, getting late. The weather looks threatening. I suppose Kaya wants to reach the next post house before dark. I hope our quarters are more comfortable than the ones we had last night, too. Time dragged on and the afternoon merged into premature darkness. I began to wonder if we were going to reach a post house. Progress with three horses was slow. They were facing into a bitter wind, a wind which promised snow. And we could hear Kaya cursing and urging the coachman at intervals. And soon the wind took on a higher note. Great flakes of snow clogged the steaming windows. And presently the muffled sound of wheels and hooves told us that the fall was getting heavier. Oh, heavens, I'm cold. Oh, God help poor sailors on a night like this. <laughs> we look like spending the night in the coach, sir. Uh, uh, something's wrong, sir. Uh, listen. Hold on to the stretcher, sir. We're going over. Oh, blast. What are they doing? Oh, you're all right, Bush? I'm all right, sir. What's happened? Well, we're not over, sir, but uh, finishing near it. We must have left the road. Uh, well, but... Oh, look, we're almost hanging over a river. Yes, I can see right on the bank. Coachman must only just have seen it in time. A fine coachman you are! A fool! And son of a fool! Why didn't you drive straight into the river and save me the trouble of reporting? Huh? Come on, you men! Do you want to stay here all night? Get that coach back on the road, you helpless idiot! Excuse me, sir, it's heavy! If the gentleman inside moved it out, we would have a better chance! Well, they can please themselves. Get out and help or spend the night in the snow. Brown, Brown, come closer to me. Ah, dear. Did you see that boat on the river? Uh, did you see it as we stopped? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, a rowing boat moored to a post. Well, why, <clears throat> why shouldn't we escape in it, Brown? Six minutes from the time I had conceived the idea, we were in the boat and free on the Black River. In the darkness and with the bustle going on around the coach, we'd slipped away unnoticed. I wrapped Bush in blankets and my cloak and propped him in the stern sheets. Oh, oh give me a scowl, Brown. Oh, no, sir. Now, you fend off port side, I'll take starboard. All the boats spinning and punching like mad, sir. I, I can't get a grip. They seem to be caught on a rock. The water's pouring in. Oh, heave here, Brown. Oh, no, no, no. Now, all together. All you've got. Put your air. She's clear. We're through. Uh, that was a near thing. Yes, too near for my liking, Bush. I hope there's not many more of those. Is there a bailer in the boat? Yes, sir. I, I saw it when we got in. I went on it. Ah, here, here it is. Sir. Well, bail then. I'll take the skulls. Any idea where we are, sir? Oh, it's difficult to say. Can't be the Rhone. It must be the Loire. But if it is, it runs into the Bay of Biscay. That's, well, 400 miles away. Oh, that'll be a useful run, sir. Hello. The keel's scraped again, sir. Yeah. I believe we're coming to another rapid. stern lift and drop successively as we shot over what felt like a downward step in the water. The din of the rapid became tremendous. The white water boiled round and over us. Something invisible struck our port side and I heard the gunwale splinter. The keel caught and I pitched forward, but then she freed herself and the boat sped on. I heard the roar diminishing. We were through another rapid. Light on the starboard bow, sir. Yes. Uh, and there's another. A and another. This must be a village on the river bank. Probably Novaire. The coachman said it was six kilometers. Oh, we've come four miles already. Hey, Brown. 
Stop bailing. Aye, sir. Keep quiet now. A bridge flashed by over our heads. The water was so high that we had to duck to miss the arch. It was still snowing and ice coated the floorboards. More rapids ahead, sir. Brian, stand by to fend off on the port side. Aye, sir. Good God! Oh, beg pardon, sir, but it's not a rapid. I think it's a fall. It is. Well, hold on, everybody. We're going over. Rocks. Watch out for the rocks. Steep, steady wave at the foot of the fall was as solid as stone as we hit it. The boat vanished from under me, and I felt myself strangling underwater and scraping over the rocky bottom. It was agony, agony. I got a single gulp of air, and then I was under again. The grinding of the rocks on the riverbed was louder than thunder. Another precious gulp of air which seared my lungs like fire, and then I was under again. My reeling brain guessed what was happening. I was caught in the swirl below the fall. I was being flung in a circle, now on the surface and now right down on the bed. The pain in my chest and the deadly grip of the icy water on my limbs were numbing me. I was losing the desire to fight. I only wanted to be still and die. Suddenly, something touched my hand. I gripped it. It was a piece of board with nails in the end of it. A plank from the boat, now shattered into fragments and whirling around with me. With the last convulsive movement, I thrust hard at the bottom with the plank as I went down again. I came up, caught a breath, and another, and then another, and I floundered and stumbled, and then fell and lay gasping in only a few inches of water at the edge of the fall. Oh, there! Captain! Captain! I'm... I'm here. Oh, thank God, Jack. Thank God. The captain's here, Mr. Bush. Oh, right. I heard Bush's feeble voice reply, and it shocked me to my feet. If Bush were alive, he must be looked after. Uh, there's a light out there, sir. House, I expect. Uh, well, we, we must get to it, even, even if it does mean surrender. Uh, if we don't get Bush to warmth and help, he will, he'll die. And we'll carry him up. Ah, uh, sir. Uh, get your arms around our shoulders, Bush. Uh, no, no, sir. Lift. Oh. Come on, uh, It's not far. Uh, how did you get out of the river? Oh, current uh, took us to the bank at once, sir. Let's see. I'd only just kicked my blankets off when I touched a rock and there was Brown holding me out. Thank God. Uh, why don't you leave me and go for help, sir? You're just about ready to drop. No, we'll get you up the bank. The light's nearer now. I felt as if I would give a fortune to lay down my burden and drop in the snow. It was ironical, too, that the three of us had been within yards of each other in the water. Yet, while the other two had been carried to safety, I had been dragged under. They would never know of my bitter struggle for life. Somehow, I felt an absurd sense of grievance against them. My head was reeling again. My strength was nearly gone. Oh, oh, oh not much, Father, sir. Oh, oh, it is... Seems to be a gardener, so it's yes. We staggered a few more steps, slipped down an unseen incline, and halted in the square of light cast by a big lighted window on the ground floor of the house. Who are you? We're prisoners of war. Wait one moment, please. Shuddering and half fainting, I held on to my burden for what seemed an age. Then the light brightened, a door opened. The voice spoke again. Come in. The warmth of the house rushed at us like a mother's caress. We half fell over the threshold and lay bush on the floor. I tried to stand up again, but my legs failed me and I pitched forward. The whole world spun about me, but my last sensation was one of warmth. Blessed warmth and dryness. There's no more river, no more cold, no more wind, no more pursuit. Only rest. For 
Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.